is a real privilege for me to be here on this high day for all of you. To commemorate and be thankful for the friendship and the relationship between the Philippines and America, it is a wonderful thing to remember where we come from and to bring the good things to share with new family. As Pastor Lambert mentioned, I shall now speak um, in tongues, uh, <laughs> but it will be the Act Two variety where everyone heard him speak, them speak in their own language. So perhaps we should pray for a gift of hearing here today. It's a special privilege for me to be here with you because I too am an immigrant. I too have come from a faraway place to associate and enjoy and be with the good folk of America. But I realize that sometimes we, we have to leave a lot of things behind when we come. And those of you born here in this country and growing up here, I'm sure have heard stories from your family. Not always easy to pick up roots and move into a new world. Today I'm also thankful for this beautiful barong that was made for me. Thank you, church, this was amazing. I may not get his name exactly right, but I want to mention brother, is it Daus? Have I got it right? Um, he is a tailor of renown, and look what he was able to do, to transform somebody uh, into a Filipino just like that. And it reminds me of the biblical metaphor of the robe of Christ's righteousness which can transform us regardless of how tough our journey has been and transform us into citizens of heaven. I'm deeply grateful and I feel um, a great sense of gratitude to be with you. Pastor Manny was very um, gifted at taking the one word title for today and weaving it into the experience of so many in leaving everything behind and arriving here with nothing. The scripture reading directs us to Paul's language, and I would like to read those words for you in one of my favorite translations, the New English Bible, which is not well known here because it's a... Um, it's a translation not by a single individual but by a whole community of churches in the UK for use in public worship. And I'll pick up these incredible words of Paul and that's what I would like to share with you today. Paul says in verse 35, then what can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or hardship, can persecution, hunger, nakedness, peril or the sword? We are being done to death for thy sake all day long, as the scripture says. We have been treated like sheep for a slaughter. And yet, in spite of all, overwhelming victory is ours through him who loved us. For I am convinced that there is nothing in death or life, in the realm of spirits or superhuman powers, in the world as it is or the world as it will be, in the forces of the universe, in heights or depths, nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God 
in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We have just come as a world through a, through a, a period of tragedy for many, millions of people lost their lives during this pandemic. But almost everyone was affected by being separated. Can you all notice that? Separated from family, separated from loved ones far away that we couldn't visit, separations of various kinds from the incredible love of God, from the incredible love of God poured out in Jesus, our Lord. But Paul doesn't just say this. In Romans 8, the second half, which I'd like to journey with you through this morning, this afternoon, Paul gives us four powerful reasons why this is true. And I'd like to share that with you, and I'd like to um, associate it with experiences that we've all had in life, so that when that happens for you, that you will re remember these four big words that are reasons why nothing can separate us from the love of God. If you turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter eight, verses 14, and we'll read through verse 17, and I'd like to share with you the first reason that Paul gives leading up to these incredible words that he ends his chapter with. So verse 14 says the following. For all who are moved, or sometimes translations say led, moved or led by the Spirit of God, are children of God. The Spirit you have received is not a spirit of slavery leading you back into a life of fear, but a spirit of adoption that makes us children of God, enabling us to cry in the Aramaic language, Abba, which is the personal tender Father. In that cry, the Spirit of God joins with our spirit in testifying that we are God's children. And if children, then heirs. We are God's heirs and Christ's fellow heirs if we share in his sufferings now in order to share his splendor hereafter. So here's the first reason. If you experience the leading of the Spirit in your life and you sense that something bigger than yourself has touched your life, has graced you, if you have a moment of that awareness of the presence of the Spirit, it is not just something personal, and something experiential, that it is, but it is also something deep and powerful. It is something that Paul would say is theological. He would say, when you experience the leading of the Spirit, know that you have been adopted as children of God. Can you say amen to that? Friends, Paul was a citizen of Rome and he understood the powerful way in which the Romans treated adoption. And some of that has come down even into our life and our world today. For the Romans, adoption was so powerful that if you were a slave in Caesar's household and Caesar adopted you, you could become Caesar yourself. Because adoption meant that despite your background, who you were, who you were the fact that you were a slave, the fact that you were not Roman, the fact that you came from some underprivileged background, none of that mattered because in Roman adoption, you were treated exactly the same as a natural born son or daughter. This is the meaning that Paul is addressing here in this text. God has adopted us as his children. What a wonderful privilege that is. <clears throat> um, Attending Redlands, my son and daughter-in-law and two of the grandkids live up here, is at Yukaipa, Country Line Road, <laughs> that, that part of the world, just down the 10. And um, they 
um, married later on, and so they had one child, beautiful little girl, and then wanted a companion for that child, but didn't want to um, go through the whole birth process, and so they decided to adopt a child. Somebody who um, was abandoned, and um, somebody that needed care. And so they adopted a beautiful little boy with lots of challenges, but it has been incredibly moving to notice how that child has thrived within his new family. He was just a few months old or, uh, when, when he was adopted, so he has grown up um, to experience a, a new home. How many of you here, anyone here who has adopted children or have friends or others who've, who've, who've done adoption? Anyone? I can't see everyone's hands. A couple of folk here. Isn't it a beautiful thing when you can adopt a child from a different background and then treat them the same as your own children if you have them or in, love them as if they were your own natural born children? That image, that experience is just a small parable of what God has done for us. Notice the language of Paul. He says that we are, we are God's heirs, Christ's fellow heirs. Just think of that. In the, in the ancient world, a firstborn typically would be the heir inheriting everything from that household. And God is saying, Jesus is, of course, the heir, and we are co-heirs with Jesus, adopted into the very household of God. So will you remember that when you sense the Spirit moving in your life and you sense and are thankful for some moment of illumination, some moment of inspiration, some moment that grace has transformed your heart, just pause and remember Romans 8, reason number one, you are adopted children in God's family. Can you say amen to that? Amen. But Paul doesn't leave it there. <laughs> He moves on to a second location and reason for us to be convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And if we read verses 18, we read about creation. Just listen to the words here. For I reckon that the sufferings we now endure bear no comparison to the splendor as yet unrevealed, which is in store for us. For the created universe waits with eager expectation for God's children to be revealed. It was made the victim of frustration, not by its own choice, but because of him who made it so. Yet always there was hope because the universe itself is made to be freed from the shackles of mortality and enter upon the liberty and splendor of the children of God. Up to the present, we know the whole created universe groans in all of its parts as if in the pangs of childbirth. Not only so, but we to whom the Spirit is given as first fruits of the harvest to come are groaning inwardly while we wait for God to make us his sons and daughters and set our whole body free. Friends, not only are we God's children by adoption, but Paul is here reminding us that we are God's children by creation. We live in a cosmos in a, in, 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 on a planet designed and intended to be the place for the theater of God's glory to work out amongst us. When you're in nature and you see the splendor of a sunrise or a sunset and you sense the beauties of nature, please remember not just that this is a wonderful world that we live in, but remember that God had an intention for creation and that intention involved you. You are special. You were intended, us as God's people, were intended to inhabit this beautiful world. Now, I know that Paul acknowledges that created world is groaning. <laughs> it is under frustration. Sometimes we sense that nature is hurting. We all need to be aware that we humans are now causing hurt to our very planet and that we need to take responsibility for that as part of our stewardship as Christians. So when you see nature groaning, remember too that this is not 
the end or the futility of God's purposes, but God will be faithful to God's purposes despite the groaning. Let me tell you a little thing, since this is a day in which we remember homelands, let me tell you a story that happened a long time ago. <clears throat> I was a student in the late 60s or maybe early 70s, I can't remember exactly when it happened, in a sister institution to La Sierra University called Helderberg College. I was a student, remember, high school student actually. And I was in the dormitory and um, lived on the upper story. It was a three-story building. And um, those days, I don't know if any of you have been to Avena schools and still remember this kind of thing. In those days, there was a lights out. It went out at 10 o'clock. And that was it. <laughs> um, any studying or what have, anything else would have to be done before. And I was trying to get the last bit of reading done. I was still dressed in school uniform. In, in the Philippines, do people have school uniforms there? Or that's just, I think it's a typical British thing. Oh, you had school uniforms, right. It's sort of like this, wearing a special uniform. So uh, it, my jacket was still on, and I, I didn't have my hat on, but you know, it was, it was school uniform. And I was standing in my room at the end of a passage, but with the door open so that the lights from the passage could shine on my book so I could keep reading because the room lights were off, but not the passage lights. And I remember standing there and all of a sudden having an incredible feeling. Now, this is a feeling that all of you have perhaps experienced, or some of you have experienced here in this part of the world. And that is when the building began to shake and the walls began to move and you felt the very ground, the very creation rumbling from underneath. It was indeed an earthquake, a fairly large earthquake that caused extensive damage in the Western Cape at the time. Several buildings on our college campus had to be repaired with huge bars going through them. But as it was happening, you know, it takes a few minutes before you become aware of what's going on. And, and, and I sensed the strange feeling and the rumbles got louder, the walls swayed more, and all of a sudden doors started popping open and the boys in the boys' dorm started running out with some clothes or little clothes on, uh, and they were running down the passage. I remember myself being swept up in the crowd trying to get out of the building, going down the stairs and saying something stupid like, don't panic, don't worry, <laughs> it's just an earthquake. Because some of them were thinking it was the day of the Lord. In fact, I believe that in the girls' dormitory, there were some who jumped out second story windows, girls falling down, praying that the Lord would you know, get their forgiveness in just before Jesus came. <laughs> Quite an experience. Have any of you here lived through a California earthquake? Of course we have the little ones, but the, a big one. The biggest one that I've lived since coming here was shortly after being here, maybe 99, 2000. It was a seven point something out in the, I think Joshua Tree area, somewhere out there. And it was certainly, you could feel it. But of course, right now, I think this building was built precisely on the San Andreas Fault. Is that right? So that um, when the day of the Lord arrives, <coughs> some will go up and others will go down. Is that the idea? <laughs> we haven't had a big one yet, but it's coming. But not only physical earthquakes. Whenever creation groans as if in as if in childbirth, pangs. I want you to not lose faith, not lose hope, not become overwhelmingly distressed, but to say to yourself, this is creation, and it's groaning like a mother awaiting and expecting a childbirth. And that, what Paul says, is the dawning of the coming of Jesus when the children of God will be fully revealed and translated and changed and the very world itself will become the new heavens and the new earth. Can you say amen to that? So we've got two reasons already that nothing can separate us from the love of God. First of all, we're adopted children of God. And so rest assured, you're part of the family. You're co-heirs with Jesus. Whenever you see the Spirit moving in your life, know that you are adopted children. When you enjoy nature and you see its beauties, remember that creation was created to be the theater for God's glory, that God is moving in this world. Yes, it has been unplugged, it has been hijacked, it has been subject to frustration by the evil one, and yes, we see 
horrible things happening, even in nature. But remind yourself that this is like a mother groaning in labor pains, awaiting the day and the time when the whole world, including the redeemed, will welcome their Lord. Adoption, creation. And now the third one takes us into a little deeper theological term that maybe many of you haven't heard or heard very often, and that is this word election. So let me read from verse 26, and I want you to think about this about prayer. In the same way, the Spirit comes to the aid of our weakness. We do not even know how to pray, but through the inarticulate groans of the Spirit himself who is pleading for us. So when you pray, remember that our prayers are human, our prayers are limited, but the Spirit prays in and through and with our prayers, and God hears in the grand glory of the divine purpose and plan. The Spirit translates our prayers and makes them effective before the throne of, of God. It goes on to say, the Spirit search, or God searches our innermost being, knows what the Spirit means, because He pleads for God's own people in God's own way. And in everything, as we know, He cooperates for good with those who love God and are called according to his purpose. For God knew his own ever before they were and also ordained that they should be shaped to the likeness of his son, that he might be the eldest among a large family of siblings. And it is these so foreordained whom he has also called and those whom he's called he has justified and those whom he's justified he has also given his splendor. Big word, election. My youngest son and wife had, uh, were expecting their baby. They live up in the San Francisco Bay Area. And do you know, it, it, it boggles my mind, but do you know that they had to make application to kindergarten for this child who was not yet born years ahead of time just so that they'd have a place in the school. This is what you call election. <laughs> this child was already registered under the name, just the surname, Webster Kid, registered to go to that school when the time came. Just think of that. God has ordained that those who put their faith in Jesus will be conformed to the likeness of his son. And this God has determined in God's own glory and eternity and grace and nothing can move God away from God's character, which is gracious love. Can you say amen to that? God loves us, therefore God adopted us, therefore God created a world for us to inhabit and to celebrate and to thank God for all the gifts that God has given, but God also elected us through Jesus to be part of his family eternally. That's why the gospel, the Bible tells us we have the gift of eternal life. It's not naturally, creaturely to have eternal life. That's God's mode of existence alone, right? And so from the very Garden of Eden, the tree was there as a promise of what God would do. And through the resurrection of Jesus, we participate in that resurrection and can have a share in God's own life. As 2 Peter 1.4 says, we become partakers of the divine nature. Does that blow your mind? <laughs> Just imagine what that means. We will always be creatures. We will never be divinized. We will never become like God or equal to God. But we will have as creatures a place in the divine trinity. In fact, to be honest, already with the ascension of Jesus, sitting at the right hand of God in heaven, we already have the representative human being in the very throne of God. Can you, can you say amen to that? God becomes human so that God can take and exalt humanity to the right hand throne of God. This is amazing. This is why Paul could have such incredible confidence that nothing could separate us from the love of God. And then after Jesus' ascension, after 40 days, Pentecost happens and the Spirit is poured out and the Spirit is God's presence in your life and among us. But surrendered him for us all. 
And with this gift, how can he fail to lavish upon us all that he has to give? God gives everything. God gives God's self when God gives us Jesus. We could not ask for anything more than what God has given us in Jesus Christ. And then Paul goes on and says, who will be the accuser of God's chosen ones? Sometimes, if we're true and honest, the question of doubt creeps into our lives. We know that we're not good enough. Sometimes we're working on overcoming, but it's like sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back. Sometimes, if truth be told, it's one step forward and two steps back, right? If you look at yourself, if you practice navel gazing, you will not have confidence. You will not have assurance. Because we in ourselves will be never, will never be good enough to make it to heaven apart from the gift of God in Jesus. Can you say amen to that? Amen. We're saved by grace, dear friends, and that grace is given us in the person of Jesus Christ. And then Paul goes on. It is God who pronounces acquittal then who can condemn? It is Christ, Christ who died and more than that was raised from the dead who is at God's right hand and indeed pleads our cause. The big word here is redemption. Paul's four reasons, adoption through the spirit, creation, we were created for this purpose of being children of God and the whole creation is gonna benefit from this great gift of God. Thirdly, election, God decided this in the beginning that we would conform to the likeness of his son. And then finally, the redemption that is ours through the blood of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen to that? Amen. This is what we often refer to as grace. And may I tell you and share with you one more experience that comes from the old country. <laughs> I was a young pastor. <clears throat> I owned at the time a little yellow bug, a little beetle. <laughs> and I would drive around in this, in this car. And um, one day, I was driving down the, the road, not a highway, but a, a, a road, from my suburb <clears throat> down towards the downtown center of Dur the city of Durban. And all of a sudden, I saw a gentleman in blue I don't know if we count them as frontline workers, but anyway, the gentleman in the blue, blue who stood up there, put his hand up there, and then came up to the window and says, you have been trapped in a speed trap. Have you ever had that happen to you? First time for me. Oh, I felt so sick. He says, you have been going, you have been going 50 miles an hour in a 35 mile an hour street. And I tried to look apologetic, I try to look um, needy, <laughs> didn't work. The ticket was written. I was so disgusted, I took the ticket. He mumbled on something about being summoned to some court appearance or something, and I just stuck it in the cubby. Do we call them cubby holes or glove boxes in this country? I, I get mixed up, you know. Um, it was Winston Churchill who said that the British and the Americans are one people separated by a common language. <laughs> Just think of the car. You know, <clears throat> I thought it was a bonnet. I came here to discover it was a hood. Um, I called it a boot, and now I discover it's a trunk. Only my car has a frunk and a trunk. So anyway, it gets confusing. And then the windshield or the windscreen, don't know which is which, the cubby hole or the glove box, petrol and gas, so it's confusing. I'm sure they're typically confusing things between the Philippines and America as well, right? I was so fed up that I got this ticket and I threw it in the thing and I forgot all about it until the day before I opened the glove box, cubbyhole, whatever you call it, and pulled it out and I saw that my case <clears throat> was gonna come before a magistrate in court the very next day. It was Thursday when I rediscovered it, and Friday I had to be back in that, I had to be in that court. 
And it wasn't just, I thought it was maybe just a magistrate's office in the, the suburb of Queensborough where I was, but oh no, it was downtown in the multi-story, nine or 12-story building, the, court, the courthouse. And so early Friday morning, I felt so sick, I drove down, got there early. I was supposed to be there by seven o'clock in the morning, got there even a bit earlier. And I asked around, I said, could I please find the public prosecutor because I want to try to get, just pay my fine and get out of this. I, I can't sit here the whole day waiting for this thing. And they told me, oh no, sorry, sir. Uh, that opportunity ended yesterday. <laughs> uh, now you're on the docket and you have to appear in court and it's on court K. All I can do for you, trying to be nice, she said, I will try to expedite your case. Have you ever had someone tell, I'm gonna expedite your case? I wasn't sure if that was good news, bad news. It sounded horrendous, but I went up there and before I knew it, this jolly thing became like a real courthouse. There was people all around and I was sitting in where, where all the, the accused people were sitting on the one side of the courtroom and um, before you know it, the magistrate came in and they really wore wigs and everything. You know, really looked like Her Majesty or, or a judge or something and became more and more terrified by this whole experience. And as the morning went on, one by one, a people went up to the dock. They, the case was rendered and they pled one way or another and you know, not a single person got off that whole morning. Guilty, 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 guilty. And as I was watching, I noticed that there was a staircase in the middle of the room. And when everyone's case was over, they would walk down that staircase. And as the morning went on, my imagination became more and more alive. And I could actually hear the cells being locked as they went down into the dungeons below. Afterwards, I discovered it was just where they uh, paid their fine, um, the cashier's office. But it was a terrifying thing. And eventually, just after noon, my name was called. And they walked up, wobbly knees, up to the front, stood there, and I just felt all the eyes of everyone else peering in on me as I began to speak. I said, what do you charge? <clears throat> the, the, the magistrate judge, I think it was a judge, didn't even look up. And I said, um, I think I, I was gonna say your majesty, but I figured it, it was probably better to say your honor. Um, I, I, I accept that I was actually going over the speed limit but I'd like to ask you to take three factors into account uh, in, um, what is the term, in mitigation uh, of, of, my, of my guilt. Please, and didn't even look up, <clears throat> so I gave the first reason. I said, sir, I was at the time driving uh, and I was talking to a friend on ham radio who was coming into the city from the other side and I was giving instructions uh, to him and, and I wasn't paying enough attention to what I was doing. At that moment, it was just nothing. He didn't even look up. I felt all the eyes of the people glaring in my back saying, what, what, a, what a, a foolish guy this is. This is no excuse for what he's doing. And it fell flat. Then I tried a second one. I said... <clears throat> Your Honor, I was actually at the time, and this is true, I was, I was going to Addington Hospital down on the, on, on the beachfront because my eldest son was in hospital. Now, admittedly, it wasn't an emergency, but he had gastroenteritis and it was really, you know, it was the first time in hospital and I was worried about my kid and so I, I was not paying as much attention as I should have. I thought that one went over just a little bit better, but he still didn't even look up. And then, in desperation, I said, and thirdly, Your Honor, I'm a minister, and I would hate to waste God's money on a fine. <laughs> and I realized when I said it how stupid that was. I was guilty, <clears throat> potentially a danger to other people. I should take my punishment. But I asked for mercy and for grace. For the first time, His Majesty, or His Lordship, or His Honor, whatever he was under the wig, looked up at me, and he glared at me. 
And he said, in the language of South Africa, um, in Afrikaans, a minister is a duani, and in the Afrikaans culture, treated with some respect. And he said, Reverend Dumini, <laughs> he said, listen, this is no excuse. You could be a danger to yourself and to others. Imagine that that little kid in hospital didn't have a father because you caused an accident. Why do you think we should take this into account? And then he said, but he said, today I am going to give you grace. I am going to give you a warning and I will let you off. I can still remember the feeling now. I felt like jumping up and singing the hallelujah chorus, right? Or at least dancing um, sort of some toy toy in, in celebration of what he had done for me. I was guilty and there was no excuse but unexplicably, out of sheer grace, I was led off that day. You know, for months afterwards, I never exceeded the speed limit, so grace does sometimes affect our behavior. <laughs> and I remember that experience, and maybe you've had similar ones, as little foretastes, little parables of the great gift of grace that God gives us in Jesus Christ. Friends, when, the, when it gets, you know, the going gets tough, we may have another pandemic ahead of us, not, not necessarily COVID-19, but this is, you know, there, there, there are things that happen. A hundred years ago, my father's mother's family were wiped out. Just two kids, two teenagers left in the Spanish flu of 1917, 18. Creation is groaning. There's trouble all around. But I want you to remember Paul's unequivocal confidence that nothing in death or life, nothing in the principalities and powers of this universe, nothing in the very shaking of creation can separate us from the love of God poured out to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. May this be true for you here at this Filipino Seventh-day Adventist Church in Loma Linda. May it be true in your families, in your life, and may you share this with your neighbors. And before too long, may we welcome Jesus as Lord of Lords and King of Kings, who will take us home. Thank you and blessings to each of you here.